now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Well, a lot has gone on since I spoke with you last. Uh, Before I get into today's topics, I want to give a shout out to our loyal members out there. Thank you for sticking with us, and thank you for believing in us and encouraging us to continue this work. Also want to give a shout out to the people on YouTube that are commenting on our videos. Thank you out there. Your comments are much appreciated. And uh, believe me, we learn as much from you as you can learn from us. It's a mutually beneficial process. It's a mutually beneficial learning process. So thank you, all the people on YouTube that comment on our videos. And also thank you, uh, especially to our members for supporting us all this time. There's a couple of topics I want to bring up. Uh, The first is what some colleagues and I refer to as the hijack. If it is a given that at least some of us had prior slash parallel incarnations in other star systems and other dimensions long before in linear time sense, before we came here and began the seemingly endless spin cycle, wash, rinse, repeat, <laughs> the karmic, uh, the karmic shuffle, let's say. Before all that happened, some or many of us were in these higher dimensional planes, higher dimensional star systems, what have you. So how did we come here? Right? How did we wind up here? I like to think that at least some of us were of the hardy, soul hardy, from the standpoint of physically, mentally, spiritually tough and wanted to come here and right the wrongs, dismantle this paradigm, what have you. Some could put the word fool in front of Hardy and say, well, some of us may have been foolhardy to come here and attempt this, right? I do believe a certain percentage of those people who had past incarnations in higher dimensions did come here as volunteers, for lack of a better term to anchor higher frequencies, and to do their part to dismantle this matrix setup. I think many others were dragged here kicking and screaming that something happened in their worlds, in these higher planes, higher dimensions, some kind of invasion, some kind of incursion. A huge trap was set up so that when the people thought they were fleeing or escaping, Somehow, some way, they were pulled down into a vortex and excreted into our solar system in this little corner of the multiverse in particular, but also into this galaxy in this dimension. And and as we've spoken before on this show, this galaxy has been the scene of countless wars, space wars, star wars for millions of years. So we go from a higher dimensional place where, for the most part, strife and what have you are unknown. But somehow or other, these negative, intrusive, archontic forces make their way there into these higher dimensions, higher planes. And they hijack us, shanghai us, pull us back into this reality, this dimension, where some of us did have incarnations on other planets. And that may have been how it started for at least some people, where the hijack occurred when they were in a higher dimension, pulled down, and then they started having incarnations in the Pleiades, Sirius, other places, and eventually began having incarnations here, thus begat the whole endless spin, wash, rinse, repeat cycle. We often hear of alternate reality ops, people having alternate reality experiences in the dream time, 
when people fall asleep, they achieve body separation, their consciousness, soul matrix, at least a part of it, separates from the body, and essentially goes dimension hopping from one place to another, one plane or dimension to another. Others are very adept at this. Others can consciously do this. Speaking to my labs and certain abductees, contactees, I'm satisfied that some of them, the legitimate ones, do have this alternate reality capability. This capability of going from our plane of existence, our dimension, to another one. And sometimes these seem to happen at an oversoul level where we're not consciously even aware that we're doing this. We just find ourselves in some alternate reality battling zombies or rescuing people from underground reptilian lairs, whatever the case may be. What if, what if, and I'm just thinking out loud, one often hears talk about Oh, this world is a big simulation. This universe is a big simulation. It's a big computer program. It's a hologram, so on and so forth. Well, we still have to live in it. We still have to breathe in it. We still have to exist in it. And we go through all the gamut of emotions, happiness, sadness, love, hate, tragedy, strife, plenitude, serenity, all points in between. It's a free free for all. It's a, what they call it in Vietnam a free fire zone. So that's really happening and I'm not detracting or marginalizing that aspect of it. We're here, we have to deal with it, whether it's a simulation or not. But what if, what if at an oversoul level we had either chosen to or circumstances were set up where we were pulled down into this reality, into this dimension, to be caught up in this endless spin cycle, this karmic cycle. And what if the alternate reality experiences some of us are having and remembering, to the point where some of us can actually, some people I know, can actually sit down and write out from A to Z everything that they experienced the night before in alternate reality in minute detail and in fact they go often go back to these alternate realities interact with people beings oftentimes the same people the same beings in the same places right what if we ourselves us on this plane in this dimension we are the avatars if you will of more metaphysically advanced counterparts who have more metaphysical capabilities, can consciously utilize metaphysical capabilities, super strength, agility, flying, teleportation, what have you. And our counterparts are that much more ahead of us as far as capabilities are concerned in some of these alternate realities than we are. And what if the alternate reality experiences that people are reporting, consciously taking part of, part in rather, that it's kind of a, a bleed through into this life where some people can consciously go into alternate realities and do things, but others can't consciously do it. It's just something that happens. And what if the aspects of them, their counterparts, that are doing all these things in alternate realities, manifesting all these abilities, we're kind of like the minor league version of that at this point. Almost as if, as part of the hijack process, our DNA profile, our higher dimensional DNA profile, our soul matrix, or aspects of it, were brought here, an avatar was created for us in order to take part in this endless spin cycle rinse, repeat, wash, karmic thing. But our real selves, quote-unquote, or at least the real potential that we have to do, to do all these metaphysical, superhuman things, if you will, that our counterparts are doing that. And in many ways, at an oversoul level, where all of our counterparts come under this umbrella of oversoul, past, present, future, parallel, 
in an oversold basis. We're just waiting for us in this reality, the reality that you're listening to me at, to catch up. Because I think that that's part of the process of reintegration. It's not only that we reintegrate fragmented aspects of ourselves that have been kind of severed from us as a result of trauma in this and other lives. This is what Bernard Gunther and and Laura Matsu were just talking about and, and others have discussed. And those fragmented parts of ourselves can, particularly as a result of external malign influence, develop a character, develop a destiny, develop a will, develop a conscious identity of in and of themselves. So not only are at least some of us trying to reintegrate those aspects of us that have kind of been split off as a result of trauma and manipulation and traps of agreement in this and in previous incarnations, but what if you go far enough back to when we first wound up in this dimension, wound up in this galaxy, if that was an av- originally an avatar that was created for us in order to exist in this reality and take part in this big karmic game. Because these archontic parasitic entities, they require a food source. They can't get a feed off of themselves. Oh, they can war happily amongst themselves, if you want to call it that, happily, but as far as nourishing, as far as having a slave population, as far as extracting as much louche as possible out of a subject population, and if they're not getting what they want from the local denizens, the native denizens, from this, that, or the other planet in our cosmos, like perhaps there's only so much they can get out of a for lack of a better term, primitive race of hominids or hominoids on this or some other world. Oh, sure, they can enslave them, mind control them, interbreed with them, genetically uh, splice and dice them, whatever the case may be. But what if they want more out of that? What if they want a feed from higher dimensional beings? Because it it nourishes them, or it enhances them, or it, it... fulfill some kind of craving that they need. Who knows what the real reason is. Hence the need to create a vortex to pull people in from a higher dimension and plug them into this reality. And as they go through into this initial hijack, that's where the avatar is installed, right? So it's still their real consciousness, if you will, but kind of an overlay has been put over it, a mask, if you will, a, a an outward covering over the real authentic self, which had been hijacked. And part of our journey is to remove all those layers, not only reintegrate and heal from all the trauma in, in this world, in this dimension, in this galaxy, in this universe, but to reintegrate with our counterparts from alternate realities, eventually reintegrate back to our oversoul. And at that point, our oversoul can choose, well, I'm going to send you know, parts of me here, there, everywhere to, to learn, to, to do good, to do good works. I just thought I'd throw this out there, because when I hear these stories about alternate realities... To be sure, there's a degree of frustration there. It's like, geez, you know, I wish I had these powers here, right? But for some reason, for for many people, they seem to have these abilities, but only in an alternate reality sense or in a my lab sense. Oftentimes, it is my labs, not always, not exclusively, but oftentimes my labs that are describing these alternate reality ops, people that have had my lab military deep black encounters. Yeah, as well as ET and non-human life form encounters. It seems that it's a certain DNA profile, a certain energy field within the soul matrix, the light field, the light being that makes up, it's the essential core of every individual. 
And again, every individual here that may be an avatar for this oversoul, and that oversoul kind of oversees the activities of numerous versions of itself, ET versions, non-corporeal interdimensional versions, counterpart versions of ourselves, past life versions of ourselves on this planet in a linear time sense. I just thought I'd throw that out there because these are the discussions that I've been having with, with my colleagues, musing, thinking out loud, if you will. And for those of you listening, I, I'd like your thoughts on that because, again, here at the Cosmic Switchboard, we're not all knowing, we're not all wise. We learn as much from you, the listeners, as you can possibly learn from us. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, a symbiotic relationship, if you will. Now, this segues into the next part of the discussion because, again, these parasitic archontic entities, they need to feed off something because they're essentially parasites. Now, what happens in our reality when something dies and the process of decay sets, sets in? Well, flies, maggots, bacteria, all different kinds of life forms begin feeding off of this dead organic mass that used to be a living vibrant being, where there was an insect, a uh, single-celled organism, a mammal, whatever the case may be. So keep that point in mind, this parasitic feeding, because there's also a spiritual aspect to that, and why, and I've said this before, why there has been such an overt attempt to reduce humanity to its lowest common denominator to make everything uh, repugnant, disgusting, uh, gross, vulgar, because filth, spiritual filth, physical filth, physical pollution in all its varieties, radiation, uh, rotting garbage, plastic, uh, filling up the landfills, feces in the street, human feces in the street, which I'm going to talk a lot more about. And don't worry, I'm not going to get overly vulgar on you. I'm, I'm making a point here. The powers that be want to reduce the human condition to the lowest possible denominator. Turn this whole planet into one big feculent cesspool. Why? Because it brings in even more of these parasitic archontic interdimensional entities and extraterrestrial entities and entities, uh, corporeal entities coming up from the inner earth, coming up from the subterranean caverns because they're attracted to the filth, okay? They're attracted to the stench. They're attracted to the decay. And I'm not speaking metaphorically here. I mean this in a very literal sense because what we're seeing now played out especially in these communist-controlled cities like Seattle and San Francisco and Portland, Oregon, so much of it on the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest, the absolute filth that has been allowed to, to manifest willfully, deliberately, is bringing more and more of these these entities in. They're not only coming in as, a result, as the result of CERN, as the result of the 5G. The filth itself. Have, haven't you ever been in, in a place, it could be a derelict house, it could be a squatter's house, it could be a friend or a relative or an acquaintance who's just an absolute slob. Just a dirty, smelly place. Not only was the air foul in these places, fetid, disgusting, reeking, but the energy, the atmosphere, the energetic atmosphere along with it was sullied, was totally disgusting and dirty to the point when you leave the place, the first thing you want to do is take a bath. And then when you consider what's happened to our oceans, beaches, our forest, and now they're cutting down huge swaths, or burning down huge swaths of the Amazon, which are the lungs of this planet. 
And you can even go further back and look at, and I've talked about this before. Uh, if trees are the lungs of our planet, what about these gigantic prehistory trees? I'm one of those people. I have no reason to doubt. Because to me, it's scale invariant. When I look at these videos on YouTube, talking about how some of these plateaus, buttes, and mountains and mountaintops are really the remains of gigantic tree stumps. First of all, someone or something with enough technology <laughs> lopped these things off. Razor cut. Now you have a butte. Now you have a plateau. Now you have a devil's tower type place. But then you look at all the features in and around the mountain, you see the same exact same thing with trees. So following the analogy of trees are the lungs and vegetation are the lungs of our planet, well, someone way back when decided a long time ago, let's cut down all these big trees that reach high into the sky, like in the movie The Avatar. And it fulfills two purposes. One, it reduces the the air supply, oxygen supply, by that much, because everything is inversion, right? We're told that carbon dioxide is bad. No, carbon dioxide is essential. It's what trees utilize to convert into oxygen. And there's no telling what kind of capabilities, metaphysical or otherwise, physical or, or metaphysical, we'd have if we had that much more oxygen to work with. I mean, just imagine how much oxygen was available during the age of the dinosaurs. Now imagine we had that same amount of oxygen now. Imagine what that would do to our brain power. Imagine what that would do to our cells. I mean, you hear all this talk about, well, yes, you have to work on your breathing and, you know, get the breath really deep down into the lungs and work on conscious exhalation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What if we had been all along in this environment heavily saturated with oxygen? Who knows what we could have achieved? Who knows what we could have done? So on the one hand, they're cutting down these huge trees, thereby reducing the oxygen content by that much. Secondly, it's maintaining the cover-up. Because if we all woke up one fine day and we saw these gigantic trees, trees reaching into the sky, well, you know, I don't know about anyone else, but that would <laughs> raise questions in my mind. So getting back to the point, now I'm making Amazon burning down, chem spraying, pollution, air, water, land, and now increasingly the filth that's showing up. Not not just in the inner cities, in, in the, the main streets, uh, in front of courthouses, in front of municipal buildings, because of the homeless situation that's been created and the pernicious nefarious activities of all these leftist, communist, cultural Marxist mayors, city councilors, city managers. They're taking the filth. It wasn't before, you know, I would talk about all the filth and vulgarity on, on TV, on Saturday Night Live, on, uh, on the Comedy Central Channel and all this other stuff. Nothing funny about it. It's all just vulgarity. But now it's, it's not just vulgarity of the mind. It's vulgarity, it, it, it's pollution, it's stench, it's rotting, decaying things on the streets of America. And that will raise the level of paranormal events, raise the level of entity infestation, raise the level of people to being taken up as host, that much more. I had Sue Plavetic on this show a few months back. And she talked about whether etheric third eye vision, how, well, she sees these dark shadow entities hanging around abortion clinics. She sees all these entities swirling around these towers, these wireless towers. And they may not have even been 5G. They could have just been like the older 4G towers, wireless telecommunications towers. How much more of that Will we see etherically and feel energetically when the 5G rollout is at, is at its height? Because Sue said there was all kinds of entities and all kinds of weird, you know, magical hoochie swirling around all these radio towers. 
So there's a conscious effort to bring all this stuff in. It reminds me of H.P. Lovecraft and how in some of the books, the novels he wrote, one of the themes was all these rituals will be created, will be done for the express purpose of opening these huge portals and these huge stargates to allow, quote unquote, the old ones in. Because if you go by what Tom Montauk says, I have no reason to doubt it. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in this. He talks about the organic portal, how people that are people that are um, seemingly organic, walking, talking people are themselves these portals, these gateways for all these different entities, actual conduits into other realms, other dimensions. And some of these types are real energy vampires, real energy drains. And they can get that way in a variety of ways. Being a meth head, a tweaker, a cokehead, entity infested host. Okay, I'm going to talk now about the feng shui aspects of what, what it means to have a bunch of filth all over the place. And then I'll, I'll round out this first segment and go into details more uh, in, in the members section. I alluded to earlier how the Hollywood entertainment business run by all these Talmudic types, how they've for so long now been pushing vulgarity, filth, feces, uh, just all these various abominations in our faces and making it normal, right? Oh, it's funny. It's supposed to be a joke. Oh, look at that. It's uh, feces. Ha, 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 ha. That's hilarious. And that became the norm. I mean, just think of all the Seth Rogen movies, the, uh, I forget what movie it was that, that Seth Rogen or one of his cronies was in. But uh, anyway, it was just such a vulgar scene. It doesn't even bear repeating here. Not even worth repeating here. But the point of relevance is they've normalized vulgarity, uh, putrefaction, uh, disgusting stuff all across the board in all its forms. They've normalized that. They've put that on TV and in the cinema and what have you. Okay, so keep that point in mind because the same powers that be that control Hollywood are by and large the same ones that are responsible for all the filth in these aforementioned communist-controlled cities like Seattle and Portland and San Francisco. What they are experiencing and have been experiencing for some time is a feces problem where they've just made it legal, made it normal for homeless people for anybody, really, to defecate in public, defecate on the sidewalks, defecate on the streets. And it's reached a point of absurdity, folks, where it was the uh, a councilman in, in Seattle, Larry Gossett, says it's racially insensitive, it's racist to use high-pressure hoses to spray water and wash the excrement, the human excrement, off the sidewalks. It's racist because it's too reminiscent of using fire hoses against civil rights activists from the 60s. Remember that? Those iconic images of, of uh, civil rights workers and blacks being blasted by fire hoses by the police? But this guy in Seattle, this council member, is saying, oh, no, we can't use hoses and spray water on feces, on human excrement, off the sidewalks. That's racially insensitive. And when I first heard that, I, I didn't think about the civil rights aspect to it. I mean, any excuse will do, folks, right, with these whack job commies. No, I just thought, okay, wait a minute. Is it because the crap is brown or dark? And then if you spray it, you're being racist by getting it off the sidewalk? 
Is that what he's banging on about? And then I thought about it. Well, you know, because of the sun, because of bleaching, because of poor nutrition. And I'm not being vulgar here. I'm not giving too much information. TMI. But sometimes turds wind up white. I've seen it happen. Dogs that are given very bad dog food, for example, you know, and, and then you know the dung is exposed to a lot of sun, a lot of the elements, they turn white. I just saw one the other day, a white dog turd. So what happens to that? Oh, you can't leave that white dog turd or that white human turd on a sidewalk. That's white privilege. That has to be washed off. I mean, I'm not even going to try to get into the minds of these whack jobs. And cities like San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, it just there's excrement everywhere. There's poop everywhere to the point where there's enterprising young man, and I think he really did a great job. He came up with a phone app called Snap Crap. That's right, called Snap Crap. And what it does is, you know, when you're in San Francisco or anywhere else, he apparently he was a native of San Francisco. And this hits me kind of personally, folks, because you know what? I grew up in the streets of San Francisco in Daly City, which is right next door. Shorin Street, Acacia Street, the Cow Palace. That, those, that was my old stomping grounds. I used to go to Rody, um, you know, not rodeos, but I used to, you know, visit a lot of the cow pens and a lot of the horse stalls and horse barns and whatnot and, and go to the circus there in the cow palace and went to many co concerts there. And now to find out that the streets of San Francisco and Daly City are just covered in excrement. Well, anyway, this guy, he developed a uh, an app, a phone app called Snap Crap. And the new app lets users snap a photo of the area in San Francisco that needs to be cleaned up and then sends a report to the city's 311 hotline. Good idea. And uh, San Francisco, actually, uh, I don't know if they've already done it, but they were talking about it. They were going to allocate a, a budget for, like, this special poop patrol to go around and, and, you know, pick up the human excrement. Well, I'm glad they're doing something about it better than in Seattle where oh no you can't spray the crap off the sidewalks because that's racist can't do that to dark or brown colored dung right you can do it to white crap of course white privilege right uh, but oh it's racially insensitive to to you know to blast the, the excrement off the sidewalks uh, it just it reminds us too much of when civil rights activists are being blasted by uh by, by fire hoses back in uh Selma, Alabama and places. It's got nothing to do with anything. Any excuse will do. But the point of relevance, folks, is they've brought down the level, the quality of life to such an extent. And that's not even talking about all the crime because there's so much excrement around the courthouses that in some of these places, uh, in Seattle and elsewhere, you know, jurors don't even want to report to jur jury duty because not only do they have to negotiate and navigate their way through all this crap on the sidewalks, but they stand a very real chance of getting assaulted by all these, uh, you know, what mainstream society would call uh, mentally ill people, but, you know, people like you and I and Jerry Marzinski would say, oh no, these are people that are hearing voices and they're, they're entity infested, basically. So jurors are afraid to go to the courthouses to take part in jury duty because they're afraid of getting assaulted, folks. That's how bad it is. And in the next segment, I'm going to talk about it just goes from bad to worse. What some places in North America, what they're doing is, and I don't know how widespread this is, and I don't know why they would utilize uh, these services or make these services available in a small town. But in some of the smaller towns and smaller cities in Canada, and I'm sure elsewhere, they've set up these legal shooting galleries 
where people can go and take drugs, illicit hardcore drugs, and there's nurses on staff, you know, in case someone ODs, and and it's led to all kinds of crime and a radical increase in crime because again, the drug use leads to energy infestation, and the energy is working through all these people on drugs, and some are going to act out violently. And it, it's when I was reading these reports, I, I just well. For those members, just plug in a part two, and I'll go into details about it because it's just, it's so bizarre. And it's just symptomatic of just how much the society has sunk in the efforts these Talmudic types are, are making to just turn everything to the lowest, scummiest, dangerous level possible. Anyhow, you reach the end of the first segment of Bartley's commentaries on the cosmic wars. If you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com sign up and become a member and we'll see you at the top of the next segment <laughs>